Fantastic. Okay, so we are recording. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining me tonight. Uh, this is a deep dive. We're going to talk about uh, wildlife disguises. I'm going to get right into it. Um, oops, I need to share that screen for you. It's been two months since I did one of these, so it's been a little while. All right, so. Here we go. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about wildlife disguises. Um, I would hope that everybody can kind of see how this is a timely topic uh, in many ways, um, certainly for the month, but also for what we're currently going through. Um, ma masks and costumes, I think, have been parts of different cultures in different ways for um, probably as long as is you know we've recorded history uh the mask on the uh on the left there is really neat is a mask from uh, gabon and i believe it's used in a ceremony which is an inquisitorial search for sorcerers um hopefully that doesn't end as poorly for some of them as it may have done for during other quote witch hunts in the past but i thought it was a really interesting kind of mask there uh and then hopefully everybody recognizes batman uh on the right there adam west from the 60s um I think today a lot of our, our costume and mask use is more of a um, traditional kind of Halloween celebration there. Uh, that's my little one on her first Halloween. Very serious about her costumes. Um, and, 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 you know, wildlife disguises can be very, is a very serious thing for the wildlife that use them. Uh, it's also not very conscious, and I wanna, uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, and, and again, like I said, um, right now it's certainly one of those times where um, you know, mask use is, is, is has a very different uh, and important uh, symbolism within our cultures. So why a disguise? Why would uh, wildlife um, use disguise? Um, it's, I think the obvious one and the one that most people would think of right away is to either avoid predation or to sneak up on um, your prey uh, to catch and eat. For many uh, predators, especially if you're avoiding predation, and if you're a predator, you're not very big, you need to do both. Um, so that's really important. But there are other reasons to have a disguise as well. Uh, to successfully mate, uh, especially if you're not an impressive uh, member of your species, sometimes you have to be sneaky in order to successfully mate and pass on your genes. Uh, to get pollinated, there are um, certain flowers or certain plants I mean, that rely on trickery to uh, for pollination. And uh, to parasitize, uh, nobody wants a parasite, so you've got to be tricky and sneaky. On um, there are different kinds of parasites that will, will use a disguise to get close to their host, and um, uh, and look scary or distasteful, especially when you're not. If you don't have a really good defense, but you are, you look or resemble an animal or a plant that does, then that is is certainly really helpful to have a disguise like that. Um, so this is the, uh, it's called a granite ghost. This is kind of neat. This is a, um, a dragonfly that's native to like India, India, Sri Lanka, and, and Thailand. And they got this great body. Uh, they tend to be around uh, water areas, certainly pools of water, but you also find them in irrigation channels, wells, that kind of, those kinds of places. Um, they obviously with their colors can blend in very well in rock. They would also, depending on the color of the irrigation channel, the well, um, other buildings, they can uh, blend in as well there. So it's a really good advantage. I'm not going to talk about, or I, I'm not interested, at least tonight, in talking about just straight up camouflage. I want to talk about um, when a, a disguise or when uh, an adaptation looks more like something else, when it seems more like a disguise, when it seems more like a costume. And again, it's, it's important to remember, this isn't conscious. This dragonfly doesn't wake up in the morning and say, hey, putting on the gray outfit again. It's the only one that works and it's the best one. It's about, um, you know, the result of, of, you know, years and years, hundreds, thousands, millions of years, however long it is of, of um, natural selection and evolution, uh, shaping a species to where it's successful. And this can come and go. And I, I got a great example. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And it's a classic example. And a lot of you may have heard of it, but I want to examine it in the, the framework of, of wildlife disguises. Um, this is a uh, Carolina manid. It's a, our one of our native manids. Uh, and again, this is um, uh, a predator that can also be a prey species. So it's sneaking up on its prey and avoiding being eaten all at the same time. It's got a really good camouflage. It's not really a disguise. Certainly looks green. And you could argue that it looks leaf-like, but I, I don't feel it qualifies as a, as a quote disguise. And we're going to talk about some mimicry in a minute. That's really going to kick in for us here. Um, 
This to me is more of a disguise. This is an orchid manis, uh, not something that you'd find around here, and they live on and in orchids and look very much like a part of that flower. And um, it's much more um, distinctive because if you find one of these on a leaf, you're going to know it's not part of that leaf. And so it's a very specific uh, uh, scheme or um, look that uh, helps it to camouflage and also to catch it. It helps it to camouflage to catch its prey or to avoid being eaten. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, there are many, 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 many moths. Uh, species of moss in um, the geometridae family or the geometer moss and a lot of them have caterpillars uh, that are very twig-like uh, remember you know resemble wood uh, or the bark this one uh, in fact i don't know if the species of this one is i discovered this the other weekend um, taking down the uh, little playhouse my daughter has in the backyard and moving it inside and i almost squashed them I just happened to look before I stuck my fingers around, mostly because there's tons of spiders in there. Um, and so I looked before I, I grabbed uh, and found this guy, little guy, just on the on the very, this is like the actual corner of the top of, of a board, and just stretched out and didn't move. In fact, it was he was stuck on there pretty good. It was difficult to get the caterpillar off, and I put him on a nearby tree. I hope that was helpful. Um, but the ge geometer moths are the ones where, like when you see, uh, what we think of as inchworms, very much... Um, those are the geometer moss. And so some of them can be very twig like. I've even seen they stick up in the air like they're part of a stick that's been broken off. Uh, so they can have really, really good camouflage. But to me, this is this is more like a disguise because they're trying to look like something, not just blend in with what's around them, but they're trying to look very much like a part of that bark or that stick. And again, I shouldn't say trying because it's not a conscious effort, but they do look like an actual part of the environment instead of just blending in with the colors of the environment. And that's the distinction I was, I tried to make when I did this because I can go down, I mean, there's hours of information on, on camouflage and mimicry. And, and again, I only have one. Um, now, here's another attempt to look more specific. These two moths, um, I think they're both beautiful species in their coloration, but at first glance, you could look at them on um, on a leaf or on the side of a tree and think, oh, look, a bird pooped here. Um, this is Schlager's fruitworm moth. Uh, the one on the right is a, if I remember correctly, I think it's a beautiful wood nymph. Um, these are both moths. Um, these both, both of these pictures are from uh, Reston, but again, these are both species you can find here uh, in Northern Virginia. Uh, and they were coming to, or they were attracted to the uh, security lights on on the center where I used to work. Um, and I saw I saw this one several times. I this one only once or twice, but beautiful colors. But again, that that color combination very much looks like um, bird droppings. And they're not the only ones that will utilize that kind of uh, coloration or appearance uh, to hopefully avoid detection. <clears throat> this is a bolus spider. This was actually taken in uh, the Mets Wildlife Bank. Um, just down in Woodbridge. Uh, this is a bolus spider, uh, and it, to me, looks a little bit like bird poop. There's a really famous one. I try to use a local one for this, but there's a really famous one called the bird dropping spider, and that is um, that is found in Australia, and that's literally its name is the bird dropping spider. Uh, and they're again trying to avoid detection. They're looking like something that is essentially something you wouldn't want to eat. I sometimes wonder too if um, if you're that spider. Excuse me. If you are also uh, able to attract maybe small flies, you're like, hey, that looks like uh, some poop, and that's the kind of thing I like to eat, and maybe that gets them their prey. Although I would imagine that um, for the flies, part of the detection might also be um, scent. Um, we are very much seeing organisms. Our, our chief sense is our uh, sense of sight, and so having, uh, and so you'll find that um, this presentation at least is very heavy on on uh, site you know, it's kind of hard to convey a smell or a feel uh, through a PowerPoint but they um, but there's a lot of really good wildlife disguises that don't involve don't just involve sight but involve um, a tactile sense or involve a smell or even uh, a acoustic even sound where you're tricking another species or members maybe even of your own species by um, making a sound or a smell or having a texture that uh, fools them into thinking that you're something else. And so again, this bull spider here is uh, definitely trying to trying not to be noticed and, and looks a lot like uh, a bird dropping on a leaf.
In fact, the caption of the, the person, the photographer says uh, that they thought they were looking at bird dropping and they, something made them look closer and they realized it was a spider and, and not bird poop. Um, speaking of looking a little trashy, this is a lacewing larva and they are uh, carnivorous and they will gather little bits and pieces all over them. And, and you may or may not have seen these. These are um, fairly common around here and you'll see uh, just this little tuft of white just doo -doo 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 -doo, aimlessly seems like wandering across a leaf. Um, I actually found a video that I want to give you guys a, a few seconds of. I'm going to skip their introduction. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to mute it. I wanted to go further ahead here. Uh, and you can see, so there's a, there's a small arthropod underneath there. It's an insect larva. Um, got some pretty good mandibles. And it is simply looking for, you know, it's looking around for food, but it also looks like it's a, um, you know, a bit of detritus, a trash. I think they use, the thing I don't like about this is really loud bird calls, which it normally would find to be enjoyable. Um, there's a nice freeze frame of it. You can see the, um, I'm pointing at it like you guys can see my finger. You can see the organism underneath, and then it's carrying around on top of it. Uh, it's often called a trash bug or junk bug. It's carrying around on top of it some trash. It's some fluff, maybe some um, uh, some dirt. Uh, I think sometimes they start their trash collection with their own poo, um, you know, their own droppings, and that um, is certainly something that predators aren't always interested in eating. And so. Uh, your own droppings can be a very good uh, deterrent uh, against predation. <clears throat> uh, you will see them. You saw it, I think, you know, walking around and stuff. If you put your finger, touch it, it immediately stops to try to sell you that, ah, oh, this is just some trash or just some junk uh, on a leaf or on a stick and uh, nothing that you should pay any mind to. And they will wait, you know, several seconds before they feel it's safe to try to move again. Uh, and again, you'll see these a lot around here. Just got to keep an eye out for what looks like a little little powder puff or fluff on a leaf and give it a second. You know, just take a look and, and stare at it and see if it starts moving. You know, and like I said, I find them a lot, uh, which is neat to point them out, but it's really hard to see this little critter underneath there without destroying their costume uh, or out to do uh, and also without a mag micro uh, a magnifying glass or some other kind of something that'll make them look bigger it's very hard to see the the critter underneath there um, here's a similar one underwater this right here is a decorator crab and they grab little bits of all kinds of things and put them all over the back of their carapace uh, and again it's a it's a disguise to make them look like something that's uninteresting certainly not a nice tasty crab uh, and this is one of my favorite. This is an octopus. Um, I had a video for this, but uh, I think YouTube blocked me for some reason. Um, but this is the octopus. If you've ever seen the video of there's an octopus that has two halves of a coconut. <clears throat> it's holding them with two legs and essentially like walking across the, the bottom of the ocean with them, carrying them with them. Uh, and they'll use them to hide. In this case, these are obviously not coconut shells. These are mollusk shells. Um, but they'll use these to hide and they can pull it shut and they hide inside these little spaces. So they're creating their own uh, hidey hole or disguise. Eh, well, just some shells. There's no octopus here that you'd want to eat. Uh, and this is a, a very, when it comes to invertebrates, this is a very smart uh, species. They're very intelligent. And you have to, to be able to find um, you know, these kinds of things on the ocean floor that you will then use for a, um, a disguise. So hopefully I, I, I gave you an idea of what I'm going to be looking at, which is I'm, I'm trying to look at more critters that don't just blend into their background like deer, which are brown, and that's a really good camouflage, but they're not trying to look like trees, um, but organisms that look more like something else uh, and there's some good reason for that so there's some good strategies so we're going to go through that um, this is typically called mimicry you also see words like mimesis or even masquerade and they have subtle nuances but i'm pretty much just going to stick with mimicry for this presentation so i got a whole bunch of other terms i want to i want to throw at you here over the next uh 40 minutes um but mimicry defined by the oxford dictionary of biology uh the dictionary of zoology couldn't be bothered with it uh they only wanted to go to the specialized mimicry so i had to go to biology for this um, but I appreciate it. It's very simple. The resemblance of one organism to another, which has evolved as a means of protection. And that organism in brackets is my uh, correction because they didn't say plants. They just said animal. But there are some plants that do some mimicry too in very uh, ingenious and unique ways. Um, so a, a quick note on uh, evolution and natural selection. 
and natural selection is talks about how um, organisms as a population react to pressures from their environment, from prey species, from um, uh, the climate, from uh, the environment, and that shapes how they how that population shows up with the phenotypes and the genotypes in it. And that's the physical appearance and also the genetic makeup. Um, the classic example is the the peppered moth. Um, and I, I thought this, you know, it, it probably needs a little explaining, but I thought this was a really nice, simple way of looking at it. The, the upper image here, here's a bird looking to eat some moss. There's two moths that show up really easily. And there's one, two, three, four, maybe this was supposed to be a fifth, that don't. And those moths don't show up because they're camouflaged well against the, the, the side of the tree. Uh, they're lightly colored. These dark morphs in this peppered moth population are, excuse me, um, about 10% of the population. You know, and their um, genetics are in there pretty solidly, but I, I believe it was a recessive gene. And obviously they get picked off pretty easily, so it's much harder for them to hide and conceal themselves. Uh, and so they tend to be more prone to predation. And so they don't show up in as a large percentage of the population of these moths. Now what happened um, during the Industrial Revolution was there was a lot of sog and smut in sog, a lot of um, smog and smut in the air, a lot of exhaust, a lot of um, chemicals that colored these trees and the trees went from being a light gray to a very, very dark sooty color. So it was we're probably using, looking for there. And so suddenly you have a turnaround in this environment where now the sides of these trees favor these the darker morphs over the lighter morphs as far as hiding. And suddenly the lighter morphs are more prone to predation. And what happens is you see a shift in the phenotype or the physical appearance of these of this population uh, is now suddenly with a change in the environment, the um, light colored moths are no longer favored. In fact, the dark colored moths have a, an advantage in hiding. And so this becomes a, um, a shift in the population. And now you've got maybe 10% of the light moths and 90% of the dark moths, even though the dark moths had a uh, recessive gene that was often covered by the dominant light gene, um, that light gene is being selected against. And so you see the shift in this population. And I'm trying to remember if they've seen a shift back to this since there's been, you know, pollution controls and a little less of that, that discoloration in the forest, if that population has shifted back to being more of the light colored morph instead of the dark colored morph. Um, but it never stays the same. There's all kinds of pressures that can crop up and so populations react to these. So there's not really a, a stasis or a, a constant form and that's important to remember too. Excuse me. So these are tree hoppers. We have four different species here. One of the things I like to point out about these guys is it's almost like a double disguise because A, you're pretending to be a thorn or a spiky part of the plant here on all four of these uh, and they don't move you know they're trying I mean they move around a little bit but they're trying not to be spotted this uh, one here is probably the only one that's out of position you can see these these three are all on stems and this one is on a leaf which is not the best place for um, hiding although it's on a green leaf so that's at least helpful um, but not only are they appearing to be a part of the plant you know these thorny projections they're also a part of the plant that would make the plant look less palatable because who wants to bite down on a plant that's full of thorns and then you tear up your gums and your mouth and your lips and, and that's no good as well. So they're imitating a part of the plant and they're imitating a part of the plant that isn't palatable. And so um, there's a really good advantage to this kind of um, disguise. I want to give you a closer look. I we saw several of these this year uh, and they're really neat. And again, you know, there's the eyes, you got the, the three legs on each side and their little feet and just sitting really still and it's this big long projection, projection which kind of imitates, you know, a thorny um, contour to these plants. This was on, uh, these uh, little ones were on our uh, red buds here this summer. I saw several of these. Um, but it's also important to remember, if you're going to wear a disguise um, or if you're going to camouflage, it's all about location not doing you really good if you're in the middle of a flower or on pavement or on the side of a building where you can stand still all you want and standing still helps to a certain point um, but you're not as well camouflaged here as you would be on the actual uh, plant where that disguise works much better 
Um, speaking of what does and doesn't work in and 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 two um, and a double advantage, this is a I'm trying to remember what this is called. Uh, I think it's called a black uh, soldier fly, and it is a wasp mimic. It is a fly. Um, flies only have two wings. Most uh, insects with wings typically have four. I mean, there are always exceptions. There's some that don't have any wings. Uh, flies typically have two wings, and they have two little counterbalances at the base of where their second wing pair of wings would have been that that help them fly. But uh, if you're looking at this, this is actually a wasp mimic, uh, and that's great. Wasp mimics often um, help themselves by not just being a insect that you don't want to grab because they might sting you, but they also tend to fend off a predatory or, or parasitic wasp because um, these uh, predatory wasps do not attack each other. So there's an advantage, a double advantage, um, that you're avoiding two different kinds of two different sets of predators by having this disguise. But it's always important to remember, no matter how good a disguise is or how good a defense is, there's always somebody that can get around it, like this robber fly. Um, I always like to tell, you know, one of the, my my favorite things I always like to to go back to is the fact how you know the skunks have a a, a significant stink that they can project, you know, a significant smell that they can musk and spray. Uh, and a, you know, a predator that attempts to eat it. But if you can't smell, then it's no good. And great horned owls don't have a, a sense of a very good sense of smell or maybe even any sense of smell at all. And so they're the probably the biggest predator for skunks around here. And that is because and because they can't smell that skunk's defense doesn't work, but it works against everything else. So you got this advantage, but there's always kind of someone that could come in and be that um, Achilles heel to your defense. So let's talk about some mimicry. We're going to start with defensive mimicry, protective mimicry. Um, the classic example of this is Batesian mimicry, and this is Henry Walter Bates. Um, I just like the sideburns. Uh, but he did some work on butterflies in uh, Brazil. Uh, I think South America, at least. I think it was Brazil. And he worked on the Heliconia species. And he noticed how a lot of these species of butterfly were very, very similar. Um, and he was trying to come up with a reason why. And he realized that uh, in Batesian mimicry, you have a species that's harmless, but it's mimicking a species that's harmful. It's essentially um, a wolf in sheep's clothing. A sheep in wolf's clothing, I'm sorry. The old story about a wolf in sheep's clothing. This is a sheep in wolf's clothing. A sheep's like, hey, I'm a wolf. I, I could bite you. And this, you should be scared of me. Uh, and it's all bluff. Um, but the advantage to this is often... When you were this species where you are, let's say, tasteful um, or defenseless, uh, but you're mimicking a species with a strong defense or mimicking a species that doesn't taste good, it's less likely that a, pr a predator, especially an experienced predator, is going to take uh, a shot at eating you because they know that a butterfly that looks like this is distasteful. And so when the, these two look dissimilar, and one of these is distasteful and one is not, and they can't tell the difference, they avoid both. Um, there's no advantage. If you have populations of these two butterflies, where I'm looking at these two here with the eight, there's the eight and the eight A. Uh, and to be honest, this is a public domain image, so I don't know which one is um, the distasteful one and which one is the, the imitator uh, or the mimicker. Um, but when one is distasteful and the other is not, the advantage is to have more of the distasteful species out there in the wild because if you have too many that are that taste good and this tends to be your young predator's first meal that's not going to be there's no advantage to that and so often you'll find that whenever you have these mimics um that don't have a defense they tend to be in much smaller numbers than the uh the model species that they're mimicking uh and there's a there's a distinct advantage to that because you want to make sure that any predator's first experience with a butterfly that looks like one of these is with the butterfly that actually has the defense so that they are not going to repeat that uh predation again they're not going to try to eat that same looking butterfly excuse me um this is one of my favorite baiting mimics this is an octopus and this is called the Mimic Octopus, uh, which is not the most um, uh, original name. But this octopus, when it is threatened, will actually sit still, will wiggle these legs and imitate essentially um, sea snakes. And there are species of sea snakes which are highly venomous. 
um, which are, you know, really an animal that you want to avoid. And so wiggling these arms uh, that are banded and resemble this, this species of sea snake uh, is a really good defense and can really um, fake out predators. Uh, and I think it's just a gorgeous, I like sea snakes to begin with, but I think this is a really gorgeous uh, octopus. Uh, and that's a, a really interesting defense. It's not its only defense either, but that's the one that, that it's really pertains to what we're talking about here. Um, speaking of baits and mimicry, um, I thought this was fascinating. This is Bokila trifoliata, which is a um, has several uh, common names in Chile. You can find it in Chile and I think Argentina. It grows vines that wrap around host plants and the, the vines, when they're in contact with the host plant, will mimic the leaves of that host leaves. And they often grow around a plant that is distasteful in some way. And so um, this, this plant then mimics those leaves and looks distasteful as well. And then it experiences less herbivory or less grazing upon it, uh, which is fantastic. It's also called the chameleon vine. So you get this chameleon vine, grows up a plant that has leaves that are distasteful, mimics those leaves and avoids uh, being fed upon because its leaves look like they are also distasteful or poisonous, whatever that that plant's defense might be. Um, excuse me, and it can and it's not just the shape; it can even change the color to match that. The mechanism for this is still not completely understood. Um, it could be that there's like volatile organic compounds coming from the host plant, and I think I'm not sure if that refers to. Um, some kind of chemicals like that are allelopathic, meaning that it's a chemical from the plant that's trying to discourage other plants to grow. Um, if it's trying to send a chemical signal to uh, the chameleon vine to um, grow somewhere else or leave it alone, or if it's just um, a natural part of that plant. Uh, the other thought is there could be a gene transfer where the, um, the chameleon vine is actually receiving uh, some genetic information from uh, the host tree or uh, the host plant. Either way, I just think it's fantastic. It's it's really interesting to me that this one plant grows up another and then changes the shape and color of its leaves to look exactly like that plant. Uh, and this is something that um, you wouldn't find around here. Like I said, it's in Chile or Argentina. It's uh, a South American species. Uh, and it's the only member in its genus. Um, one type of uh, Batesian and mimicry is to mimic how another, not just the coloration, but how another animal moves as well. So the, um, hopefully you can all recognize the uh, the young lady on the right there. That is a Western honeybee, one of our, our typical honeybees, uh, Apis mellifera. This on the right is a common drone fly, and it's Aristolus uh, tenax. And they are a member of a large group called the surf, uh, which is the surfid flies, the hover flies, uh, and a lot of them are mimics of, of the, the coloration of bees and, and other stinging insects. Some of them can buzz really loudly, uh, and they can generally give off a, a, a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, convincing um, bee look. Uh, and it can often, and I'm sure it, it saves them often from certain types of predation. And again, they go for their food from flowers and spend time um, among flowers just like bees would. What was really interesting is that it was found that the flight patterns of these drone flies were more uh, like the drone, the flight patterns of western honeybees than they were other flies. Um, they, and this is everything from uh, flight sequences to velocity, trajectory, and the time spent hovering. Much, much more like a honeybee than other flies. And so there's definitely a, a behavioral mimicry there as well. And that's aerial locomotive, mi lo locomotive mimicry, essentially flying like the uh, other organism that they're mimicking. <clears throat> and then inanimate object locomotive mimicry, mi mimicry, you stay still like the object that you're mimicking. These are actually <clears throat> ghost pipe fishes. They're related to seahorses and sea dragons. Okay, they have uh, their mouth is down here. They're upside down. They're filtering out uh, food, feeding on tiny crustaceans that they can suck inside their large snout. Uh, but they're not moving. Um, this is a nice picture of the two of them because obviously they're not among the uh, vegetation that they would normally hide among, which would make them very, very difficult to see. Um, and again, um, Speaking of, of really good wildlife disguises, if you want to look up sea dragons at some point, they have some amazing, amazing um, 
designs and just in colors and, and, and shapes. It's just really, really beautiful animals. And they don't move very fast. You know, that's part of their thing is that they stay really still. Uh, they will even wave in the water, you know, if there's currents to mimic the, the vegetation around them, much like um, some mantises do, where if it gets windy and they're in the grass, they'll start to sway with the grass, trying to look like part of it so they don't stand out if they're standing still. Um, Often when I do these, I discover something I hadn't really heard before, and, and this is fantastic. This is a moth in the genus Petrophila. We have moths like this. They are, if I remember correctly, unique among Lepidoptera in that they have aquatic larvae. So their caterpillars actually live underwater and feed on algae and rocks. But that's not what's really exciting here. It is thought that the, the Petrophila and their colorations are actually uh, jumping spider mimics, that when they hold their wings up just right, um, they can look similar to a jumping spider. Perhaps not, it won't always save their life, but it can get the spider to halt or pause long enough for the moth to rep rec recognize uh, a predator and take off before it becomes a meal. So what I want you to do is, you're looking at, the, this is the jumping spider here, you can see the, the eyes uh, and you can see the leg posture. Um, the gentleman whose website I, I borrowed this from did a really nice job of framing this, this spider in a similar pose. And then look at this wing right here. This would be, this is meant to imitate the, um, the eyes, but then you've got these stripes here and it's these stripes here like this. These are all the legs. So if you, I, I can see this really clearly. It took me a little bit to get there, but if I squint at that moth, this looks like very similar shapes to the jump spider. It's not perfect by any means. And, and sometimes, I think we don't recognize the mimicry or the camouflage as well as we, we could because we have very good eyesight as a species. But this is a really, to me, a really impressive um, mimicry of a spider when it's essentially a flat surface. But I can see, again, by um, squinting my eyes so I'm, I'm not getting as defined to look at this, I can see that, that shaping there from the, the head, the eyes, and the, the legs of the jumping spider. I just think it's, it's fantastic. This is... Really, the most exciting thing I was I, I was happy to share with with you all. There's more good stuff. Don't get me wrong, um, but I really thought this was was fascinating. I never heard of this before. And again, there are species like this. There are species in this genus uh, right here in the Northern Virginia. You know, the the DMV, the the district in Maryland, Virginia. Um, I've seen these come out um, in mass uh, during an emergence along. Um, Herpes fairy, and they do have a similar, not quite this iridescent rainbow, but they do have a very similar pattern here, uh, and uh, along with the striping as well, which I think can help them um, mimic uh, jumping spiders. This is uh, these species were both from Belize, um, so they're definitely not ones we're going to be seeing around here. Um, so speaking of mimics, we're talking about Batesian mimics right now, which is. Uh, critters that don't have a good strong defense but are mimicking one that does. So this is that western honeybee, that black and yellow striping. You see black and white striping. These are both um, very similar colorations. Excuse me. If you look over here, this is a wasp. Uh, this is a, a paper wasp, a member of the Polites genus. Um, oh, I didn't. I thought I had the description here. Um, but these are also stinging insects. So they are not Batesian mimics. They might be mimics, but they're not Batesian mimics because they're not defenseless. They have their own defenses. These four here, these are three more surfid flies. One, two, three, uh, E, F, and, I'm sorry, C, D, and E. And F is uh, a beetle. Whoops, not time for you yet, Fritz. Um, and F is a beetle. Uh, and this is a, one of the species this beetle is, is very commonly found in, um, goldenrod they, they blend in quite well with goldenrod so it's a little bit of camouflage but it's also very similar to uh, the coloration of a bee and so these are pretenders there are many 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 more species that imitate this black and yellow coloration because this is such a successful coloration because there are hundreds or you know, probably thousands of species of stinging insect that have variations on this coloration um, that is a warning color it says, hey, leave me alone, or it's going to be a painful end for you, or at least a, a painful moment. And so there's many insects that like this that do not have that defense, but will imitate it. So this is baits in mimicry. This is actually something called uh, Mullerian, Mullerian, Mueller, Mueller is the guy, Mullerian, Mullerian, 
uh, mimicry. And that's this gentleman here, Fritz, who also studied um, butterflies in South America and was a contemporary to Bates, whereas Bates came up with the idea of this, um, you know, the defenseless mimicking those with a strong defense. Uh, Mueller came up with this, is credited with coming with this idea that you have two or more harmful species that come to mimic each other because, um, and he, he showed through mathematical formula. I didn't want to get into this whole thing because there's lots of letters and it, it gets you algebra whiplash. But he showed that when you have two species that look similar and their um, defense is similar, there is a cumulative effect where less of each species is predated upon or lost to predation because they essentially they are, quote, you know, my words, backing each other up. That there you have these two different species that are very similar in color, and the experience of predators on both species is ow or ew or whoo or whatever it could be, and it's distasteful or it's smelly or it's a sting, um, and they won't bother those species again. And if you and again that most to me the most successful complex of that is probably stinging insects and that black and yellow or black and white or brown and yellow or brown and white combination of stripes that is um, probably known the you know the world around is that insect could sting you uh even to the point where i'm sure people see those um hoverflies and other insects and they're like that insect can sting you even though it can't um one of the other famous ones and this probably was my guess is a lot of you probably learned about this one as a batesian mimic where um monarchs feed on milkweed they gain the toxins which they keep uh, sequestered in their body and it makes them distasteful and these orange and black this orange and black coloration uh, tells you don't eat me or you're going to get sick i mean there's some classic like i think they're in public domain photos of a blue jay that eats a monarch and then what yaks it back up and then that blue jay would not take another monarch that was offered to it they very quickly remembered it. and blue jays are smart birds probably other birds that might have to do it two or three times um but that first experience with a distasteful insect and that coloration keeps you away from it and so it was thought that these two benefited from that this is the uh, viceroy this is the queen um and it's thought that these two were harmless mimics of the distasteful monarch it turns out that both of these are also distasteful in their own way in fact the the viceroy is probably the most distasteful of the three what happens is they often describe the viceroy as being in a Mullerian complex with the monarch in um, in eastern North America, with the queen in Florida uh, and southern U.S., and with the soldier butterfly, if I remember the name correctly, in Mexico. And so these are this viceroy here is in three different. Um, Mullerian complexes are in three different associations. And so it actually has subspecies. And so in each of these areas where its closest um, associate is slightly different, like you see here, this is our monarch. See, there's you know lots of white spots on the margins here, whereas with the queen, there's a lot of white spots along the veins in inside the wings as well. So there's a, a little bit more of a, a spotty pattern to it. Uh, and then this one here, the soldier, the bottom right doesn't have as dark of veins and, and more of a uh, a two tone kind of a darker orange to the to the fore wings and a lighter orange to the back wings. Hold on, let me move this box. Yeah, I'm describing that right. Um, and some spotting up here similar to the queen. You can see all three of these almost seem like variations of this or conversely. And so what happens is um, the viceroy has a subspecies in each of these areas that is more similar to these. Uh, more similar to the species that is more prevalent there. Uh, this is a, a viceroy that was taken at um, uh, Dyke Marsh in Alexandria. Uh, so you see up here, it's very similar to the monarch. Um, if you're ever in the field and you're not entirely sure how to tell the difference, this dark line through the cells on the rear wing is what separates a viceroy from a monarch. You won't see that line through the rear wing cells on a monarch like you will on the viceroy. And that tells you the difference. Um, this is something I had learned about in grade school and never seen until I saw this one at Dyke Marsh. And so this is super exciting, my first Viceroy. Uh, and I've seen a few since then, but 
you know, and, and I know better to look for that line. Um, but they're both here. You know, they they feed in very similar ways. And and again, they're both depending on that recognition of them as a uh, a distasteful butterfly. But they both also back it up. Not, one is not faking to be like the other. They both will back that up. So if a a predator attacks in each one of these, it will that reputation and that learning of this coloration as something to, to leave alone uh, will be will be backed up. Let's see, oh, that in a slide there. There we go. Oh, that was the other one. Um, this is really interesting because this is another one I learned where this is the milk snake here in the bottom left, and this is a coral snake in the upper right. And what I learned was the milk snake is imitating the coral snake, so you'll leave it alone. But there's a difference between eating a monarch butterfly and getting a tummy ache and picking up a coral snake and getting what could very well be a fatal bite. And so this is a uh, German herpetologist, Mertensia, Mertens. Um, uh, and he, this guy, uh, yeah, Robert Mertens, and I believe he, uh, well, the theory was named after him. Sorry, there's a bunch of names here. M.G. Emsley was the original um, proponent behind this kind of mimicry. Uh, and then there's another gentleman named Wickler who named it after Mertens this type of mimicry but the idea is that neither of these two are actually imitating this organism here which is a false copper a uh, false coral snake false coral snakes are venomous but they're mildly venomous it's a survivable bite and that's where you learn is when you can survive an encounter and you come back and go all right i'm not touching a snake with a pattern like that um and then you got the, this black and yellow uh, black and yellow rings on these two snakes, and those are very identifiable. These big, bold colors are warning colors in nature, just like the big, bold colors of the monarch. And so the the idea here is you have a, that the this complex of mimicry is based off the less fatal, though not entirely harmless snake here. So the harmless snake benefits from looking like these two snakes, which are venomous, but the, the, um, venomous snake is actually benefiting from the the less venomous snake because predators who attack that are less likely to go after this one as well for fear of the same kind of um the same venomous bite uh, what's interesting is these colors can be learned uh, experientially obviously by an animal picking it up and having a horrible encounter and not wanting to repeat that again um, but there are also some species that avoid these snakes in innately um there's a bird called the turquoise browed mot mot, uh, which is a, a really, if you're a birder, it's a really popular bird to go see in, in Central or South America. And this mot mot avoids these black and yellow ringed snakes on site. Like, doesn't matter, you know, which they are or um, which kind of species and whether it can identify them or not. If it sees them, they take off, they leave, they'll um, let off their warning call, they avoid them at all costs. And it is, um, it has been shown even in like, uh, hand reared birds that grew up with in labs or in uh, captivity they've never had an experience and the first time they see a snake that's similar like this they're they want nothing to do with it and so that's an innate learning and so that's a very strong instinct to and reaction to this um coloration here as well um i don't know if, if, if any of you learned it i remember having a wildlife encyclopedia as a kid and learning the difference between the coral snake and the milk snake, which is red on yellow or white, kilophila or mite, red on black, venom lack. But apparently that doesn't work down in the South America where they've got these false coral snakes where the red on the black is still has some venom in it. Um, so I believe that that little rhyme only works in North America. And I feel like I've, I've read something like that in the last couple of years that that's a rhyme that, you know, do you good maybe in Texas, but you don't want to take it anywhere else with you. And then we've got this one, Wasmanian mimicry, where the organism lives among those that is mimicking. Um, the classic example of this, before I discuss the picture, is uh, ant mimicking spiders. There are spiders that, when they walk, they kind of hold their front two legs up like antennae. Um, sometimes their cephalothorax, that's the, the head and thorax region that's fused together on spiders and is, is um, where all the legs are attached as well, is sometimes extended to look like a, a separate head and thorax segment like on ants. 
Um, and there's some really neat variations. There's whole families of these, and there's jumping spiders that are ant mimics. Um, that could be a whole hour deep dive, really. Um, but they use some chemical cues and some um, uh, movement cues to fool the spiders and or fool the ants. And they might use that to just live among the ants for protection, or they might use it to feed on the ants. Um, but that's a, a really classic example of this. What I want to show you here is since we talked about the the hover flies and the surface flies earlier, the bee mimicking flies, I want to show you this picture. This was, um, and this is something I discovered after I took the picture. I was just trying to take a picture of these ants, which are tending these aphids. So all these little gray guys here, these are all aphids, and these are ants. Uh, so the blue is the aphids, the green is the ants, and the red, which looks like a little gray dinosaur back with all these little ridges, this is actually a surfid fly larva. So this is um, essentially a maggot because flies, are, you know, it, um, and I don't know if maggot is, is a term that maybe should be reserved for certain types of flies, but I think a lot of times people think of, you know, flies and the, the larva is a maggot, just like the with butterflies and um, moths, the larva is a caterpillar. Um, but this is a surfid fly larva, and it is obviously very much in among all these aphids, very difficult to see. Again, I didn't notice after I took the picture. Um, and it is here, and I believe they feed on the aphids. They have to do it quietly, you know, without getting caught by these ants, because these ants are protecting the aphids to um, eat what is essentially a sticky, uh, sugary liquid that the, uh, there's a little spot of it right here, uh, that the um, aphids produce from eating on the plants. So ants protect the aphids. This Surfid, lar surfid fly larva or hover fly larva is trying to sneak in or stay in there uh, and feed on the aphids without the ants noticing. And it's, I would say, doing a great job because it doesn't seem like any of the ants really noticed it. I certainly didn't notice the commotion when I took this photo. Um, so this is that Wasmannian mimicry. It's mimicking the organism it's living among. Sometimes it's for protection. Other times it's to feed on them surreptitiously. And that's what's going on here. This is this is another one that I've never heard of before. Vavilovian mimicry. This is very much an artificial selection, but when you have this is ryegrass, when you have a plant that you're trying to remove because you're cultivating or growing another plant, and you cultivate and remove the ones that are obviously different from the plants. So ryegrass can look very similar to wheatgrass. Um, and selection against the weed occurs because you're manually removing, and by you, I mean um, the farmers and the people that are growing these plants, they're manually removing the ryegrass and unwittingly or unintentionally, the successful ryegrass that reproduces is the grass that looks closer to the wheatgrass. And as you continue to do that and pull it out, you're making the remaining ryegrass that is around to um, to successfully um, pollinate and germinate and, and grow again is going to continue to look more and more like wheatgrass and make it harder and harder to, to pull it out there. There's another one called, a, there's another type called a barnyard grass which grows, um, which is a wheel, weed in rice fields and it looks similar to rice. Uh, and the seeds are often mixed in with rice and they just become so similar. And this is, there's nothing natural about this. This is very much a, a, an artifact of agriculture and, and you know growing these vast fields of of crops and you'll get some similar species in there which as they grow if, if they get winnowed out or, or pulled out as a result of, of human um, action they tend to look more and more like the crop that they are growing with something that you're not going to see on the field uh Gilbert, gilbertian mimicry the host mimics the parasite to drive it away now this is our purple passion flower, uh, and the, the species I'm talking about is, it, is another member of the genus Passiflora, and it's something that you'll find um, in South America. If you remember the, I mentioned the Heliconia uh, butterflies earlier. So these Heliconia butterflies will lay their eggs on the purple passion flower, and then the caterpillars grow, uh, you know, hatch from the eggs, and they eat. and feed on the leaves, and that can be detrimental to the growth of this this passion flower. So what this uh, plant will actually do um, is it has evolved stipules that mimic mature eggs. So these stipules on the ends of these um, uh, or on these plants look like 
mature heliconian eggs that are about to hatch. The heliconian butterflies see this and they won't use, won't lay eggs on that plant because they don't want competition for their young. So they'll go find another plant that doesn't have what looks like mature eggs on it. And so this is a way of um, preventing an infestation by um, a browsing insect, an insect that can really, you know, some in, some caterpillars in certain numbers can really damage or even defoliate a tree. Um, but the other thing that's really neat about it is um, the decoy eggs are also nectaries, so they'll attract predators of the caterpillars like ants and wasps. So as a secondary defense, if you don't discourage all the butterflies from laying eggs on your plant, you've also produced something that will draw in these predators of the caterpillars as well. Uh, and then browery mimicry. So this was interesting to me too, because I've always wondered about this. Like, what if you have, um, you know, what if you bit on the mimic first, but there's another idea that this is a same species mimicry where um, there's a palatabil palatability spectrum. And what that means is all these different monarchs are feeding on all these different types of milkweed, but not all milkweed toxins are as potent as others. And so there is a spectrum there. And so essentially the idea of this is that they, there's a self mimicry uh, within a species that they all look the same and they, so that if some are more palatable than the other, they're protecting themselves by all looking the same. Like you don't see a variation in the caterpillars from browsing on the different plants. Um, I have a hard time I'll be honest with you, I wanted to present this one. I have a hard time with this one. I'm not entirely sure uh, if I'm presenting it well or if it's a, a really interesting idea. Most of these different types of mimicries, there's some, there, you can find some debate on them. This to me at least, excuse me, seems like one of those ones that could be debated a little bit as to its veracity. Um, but these are all defensive types of mimicry. What I wanted to do is also show a couple of aggressive mimicry, uh, types of mimicry. Um, I realize I've got a few more slides here and I've only got five minutes. So if you, if you need to go, please do, but uh, I will certainly send out a link to the program, but um, I want to try to run through the rest here, uh, but it might go a little over uh, the eight o'clock end of the program here. Um, so aggressive mimicry is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, these are organisms that are trying to look harmless, but are very much uh, intent on either predation or parasitism. Um, these are fireflies or lightning bugs, depending on uh, which name you like better. The Individual on the left is a speech is a um, in the genus Photurus, and the individual on the right is a common eastern firefly in the Photinus paralis, I believe. Um, but it's in the genus Photinus for sure. The females of Photurus will often um, blink; they blink to attract, you know, to respond to the males, um, and obviously to make a connection for mating. But they'll also blink in response to the males of Photinus, but this is all about um, getting a meal out of it. And so um, I'm trying to find here in my notes, there are, so this was in the 1960s when this was figured out, uh, and this gentleman did an investigation of the female fireflies in Photurus and found that they emit the same light signals that females in Photinus do, and so they can draw in the male and feed on them. Um, the, the research showed that um, male fireflies from several different genera, so not just species, but genera, are attracted to these females. So they have quite a repertoire of different lighting, um, lights that they can uh, produce to draw in more food. Um, so there's an example of um, <laughs> not answering up that, uh, that, that uh, love ad, but no, it's, it's an example of uh, mimicry to to draw in and dupe uh, potential prey. Um, this is a Listrocelline Katie did. Uh, it's got an even longer and fascinating Latin name. But this Katie did, in addition to making noise to attract a mate, uh, can also, I think it's the females, um, can imitate um, the reply clicks of cicadas. And these are species specific clicks and not only can they do one or two species um had that number here it, it, several species and it was found that they would even they were even able to re um, respond to cicadas from other continents and again these are all species specific so um they've got quite a repertoire and this is how they would get their food they would respond to 
uh, the mating clicks of these cicadas, draw them in, and then eat them. So again, sometimes mimicry is mean. These are uh, cleaner rats, and they're cleaning the uh, the mouth of this um, this grouper here. And there is a species of blenny that looks very, very similar to this cleaner wrasse. And what the blenny actually does is does the whole imitation of the um, the dance and the approach that the cleaner wrasse does. And once it gets inside the mouth of this grouper, it takes bites out of its mouth. Um, and so it can ruin or at least make more tentative this grouper's relationship with these um, mutualistic uh, fish, these fish that they have a mutualistic uh, relationship. Um, the fish get food by cleaning the grouper, the grouper gets cleaner mouth. Uh, and you have this blending that it comes in and um, mimics these, these wrasse and then is very much not a beneficial uh, it's obviously not a, a mutualistic relationship. It takes chunks out of the grouper's mouth. Um, and so there is some ability for the grouper to distinguish between the blenny and the wrasse. Um, but as as I mentioned earlier with the with the moths, the better the grouper gets at the grouper as a species gets at distinguishing those blennies, the better the blennies will get at blending in with the wrasse. So it's going to go, it's going to be back and forth, almost like a seesaw. Um, if you were, if you were, um, whoops, if you're here for my parasitic one um, that I did earlier this summer, you'll recognize at least on the left here, this is European cuckoo and it is a parasitic brood nester, meaning they lay their eggs in other nests and let other birds take care of their young. And their young will certainly get their fill. Sometimes they hatch quicker push the other young out or hatch bigger and just eat the other young or actually I don't know if they eat the other young but they certainly can kill them or push them out and they can outcompete compete them for food from the parents. Uh, some species can recognize the eggs and get rid of them so there are some that, that this doesn't work for. Uh, but what's neat about this one this European cuckoo is it's similar in appearance to the sparrowhawk and that helps the European cuckoo in laying eggs in other birds nests because the birds are less likely to attack this European cuckoo because it looks like a predator of other birds. And so being able to sneak into a nest and if you get caught, look like a predator so that the birds still won't bother you is, is a big advantage, especially for the lifestyle of this kind of bird. Uh, and this is similar. This is a bird uh, from Asia. Uh, this is the hawk, or the shikra hawk, and this is the hawk cuckoo. It's also called the brain fever bird, and I believe the brain fever comes from the, the three note call that it gives the brain fever or something similar like that. Um, but it in every way that it flies and holds itself, I talked about that aerial locomotion with the with the um, hoverfly and the bee, and every way that it flies and holds itself, it looks very similar, even in the way it approaches um, an upward approach to a perch and then landing on it. And so it causes alarm among other birds that can prevent it from being predated upon, but it can also aid it in being a uh, nest parasite. A reproductive mimicry. This is, this is my favorite. I feel so bad for this wasp, but this is an orchid that looks like a female wasp and it attracts in the male. Uh, the male gets nothing out of it. This is called pseudocopulation. Um, and the male tries, attempts, whoops, come on. The, the male attempts to mate with this orchid. Um, and it doesn't. And so about. Yeah, uh, and it counts for around 60% of the populations of the species. If this. Um, orchid was not able to fool this. Uh, wasp, they're not able to um, get pollinated and there is and the, and the wasp. Quick with the button here and the wasps tend to learn quickly, so there's a diminishing return. Um, so hopefully you get that wasp the first or second time uh, because by the third or fourth time the wasp is starting to recognize this plant and realize that's no lady uh, and then they don't bother to um, land on it and then there's less of a chance of pollination um, but this is I think the main pollination strategy for this flower so if something was to happen to this wasp uh, this flower would very much um, head towards extinction because they depend on this tricking this wasp into mating with the flower uh, as a means of pollination. Um, 
kind of rushing through the end here because I want to want to make sure there's time for questions. These are marine isopods, and this alpha, beta, wow, this button, this alpha, beta, and gamma are all males. You can see they're very different size. Obviously, the alpha is the by size is the superior uh, male as far as mating with the the female down here in the bottom. Um, the beta are able to dance and act like a receptive female in the male's harem. The male has a harem of females. Uh, it keeps them in a sponge, literally like a little aquatic, you know, aquatic species of sponge. Uh, and the gammas avoid detection by looking like juveniles. So both the beta and the gamma will still manage to mate with some of the females, even though the females have responded to the alpha as far as, um, as far as, uh, being attracted in, in, in uh, any kind of courtship display. And so all three will mate with the harem of females. Obviously, the alpha will probably mate uh, more. Um, but it's interesting that I think as you go down this spectrum in size, it's conversely related to which ones have more, um, devote more resources to their testes, which is it's the gammas, um, the gamma males devote more resources to their testes and, and being able to pass on their genetic material than the beta or the uh, the alpha. Uh, there's something similar that happens. This is a marine isopod, so obviously not somewhere around here. There's something similar that happens in um, in the waters around here with with uh, bluegill. Uh, a male will dance. A male will go through a cool courtship, and receptive females will come up and and they will move in a certain way to signal that they're receptive. And um, smaller males that can't demand the attention that these larger males will will infiltrate this group and be in there as a small as a roughly the same size as the females and so they'll dance and act like they're a female as well and then when the male begins to um, mate with the females because it's uh, external the male releases sperm the females release eggs these sub males or these smaller males these female these males that look like females will also release their sperm into this as well so they'll get some reproductive output out of it and at the same time there will be these even smaller males that have been watching all this from like the shadows off in the edges and they come zipping in and they let some sperm go into the group as well and they run back out and so they made um they got to reproduce as well and so you have this one fish that does all this work and then all these these smaller males who are not as fit as that fish still get some benefit out of that whole uh mating and reproduction uh, so very similar there. Uh, and then I think my last mimicry here I've got is something called auto mimicry. No, you don't want to work. <laughs> These buttons uh, is auto mimicry. And that's when you have essentially um, coloration on your body that deflects uh, a predator away from say the soft parts like your head so you know eye spots are very common you'll see these on fish uh, on butterflies it's something that i think a lot of people are really familiar with or tails on something like a hair streak which is really interesting this is a really common butterfly around here this is eastern tail blue and i often will i'll stop and try to take pictures of them and they move really quick but what i noticed from from because they're so common and i'm always I love a good butterfly photo. Um, this is not one, but this is showing what I want. Is what I often will see them do is they'll sit with their head down and their abdomen pointed more up, and it causes their back wings, which have these little antennae-like projections, to stick up. And they will move those wings a little bit, and they're creating a false head. So you got the tails at the end, these filamentous little, little tails, which look like antennae and then they move and shift their rear wings repeatedly and this is causes movement and so it looks like their antennae are moving and so that is directing a predator away from their head if they should get attacked um and i have seen i've definitely seen these with missing one or both tails or even a little clip out of their their wings there um and again you can see these orange spots which might um be intended to to imitate eyes as well and so this is all about getting a potential predator that may attack you to attack the wrong end so that you don't have severe damage or fatal damage to your body. This is this this flounder is really neat. You can see these eye spots. So even even if you're a, a specialist at hunt flounder, you've got something got a choice of six eyes instead of two, uh, which again that flounder I'm sure is hoping that you'll go after one of the more colorful ones, give it a chance to get away. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this. This is a um, 
<clears throat> a pygmy owl, and they have eye spots on the back of their head. Uh, so good luck trying to sneak up on that owl, because if you're thinking, does that owl have eyes in the back of its head? It sure looks like it does. Um, and this might, I think this is a smaller owl, hence the name pygmy owl, uh, and this might make it harder for predators to feel like they're getting a drop on the owl. It might make it uh, give the owl a little more of a chance to get away because it might cause uh, a potential predator to hesitate uh, and not go at it because they think they're about to be spotted. Um, so with eyes in the back of her head, uh, I will I will leave you with that. Uh, I appreciate you all. I'm going to stop sharing here and see if anybody has any questions. Um, but I appreciate all of you being here. And does anybody have any questions? Uh, you'll have to unmute if you have one, but I'm happy to take them. I do. I do. Sure, sure, no problem. Thanks for coming, and I appreciate it. I, <laughs> I love doing these, and I love talking. So, so um, in the general, like the population of animals, do mm -hmm. we have an idea of like the percentage of animals that use these? types of mimicry and like the survival benefits like how effective it is or you know do we know you know i don't know that's a really good question i, I don't know how somebody would do that i, I think that'd be fascinating okay. on something like um um a monarch because i always like to point out to kids like somebody has to eat a monarch to know not to eat a monarch that's a really tough like you know i always talked about you know when we've talked about oral tradition with uh, some of our native american programs somebody had to eat one of the berries to be like, yeah, don't eat that berry. Um, and some of the berries don't, aren't, or mushrooms especially, aren't very forgiving. So, you know, it's the same with these critters. They don't have books and they don't have any kind of, any way of, of communicating that. But to learn that, sometimes it's innate, like the, the bird that avoids the snakes with the red and yellow rings, uh, like the mot mot. Sometimes it's, it's experiential. And so somebody's going to have to get eaten. Just like, you know, when you lay a thousand eggs and knowing that maybe 40 or 50 of them are going to survive to adulthood. You know, it's a numbers game. Um, but what those numbers are, I don't know. Obviously, it's it's certainly enough to support a population and, and they have a whole reproductive uh, and survival strategy over it. But those numbers, no, I, I, could, I couldn't tell you. Um, it would be fascinating. There's a lot of numbers I'd love to get and I just don't know that we'll ever have the, the science to, to do anything more than estimate and, and take a big guess at it. But it would be interesting. Well, thanks, Ken. I've got to go now, but this is really great. Thanks so oh, much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, oh, go ahead, yeah. Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question. So the spice bush caterpillar has things that look like eyes. Yes. Is it doing that for the same reason? It wants uh, something to it attack. So, so, no. Yeah. So, yeah, so no, that, that picture I showed you, that spice bush swallowtail, I, yeah. the, the general thought behind that is that's supposed to look more like a larger predator like a snake. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so that's because those uh, those eye spots are right above the actual head of the caterpillar. And so the idea is those are, um, that is uh, mimicking a, a snake or trying to look like a bigger and scarier predator. Like you'll, okay. you can look at um, some underwing moths, very cryptic, very good at camouflaging. But if you get too close, what they'll do is they'll pop open their their front wings they'll move them and then you see these eyes underneath this these big eye spots with this bright background and it's meant to be a startle and sometimes you know um it's, i'm not piling on ho hollywood but sometimes we're jaded by certain things we see on hollywood where it's like we did all this to fake you out and rob the bank and for wildlife it's not about this whole elaborate ploy it's just huh and that moment or that hesitation or that startle is all they need to, to get a head start and get off. You know, like, um, you know, when you watch predators sneak up on something like an impala or a rabbit, they're trying to get as close as they can. So they have the advantage of that head start because they know that they're going to be in a foot race. And if that animal's at its prime and it's got a head start, they're never going to catch it. Um, and so it's the same with this. You know, if you can get that. So if you can't hide, if you can at least get that startle, Get them to back off for a second or hesitate. You've got at least a head start or a chance to get away. Yeah, they're pretty spectacular looking. Yeah, oh yeah, they're beautiful. There's there's some really good um, caterpillars with like essentially that snake mimic pattern. That's just it's it's breathtaking. It's really beautiful to see. Well, thank you, Ken. No problem. Thank you. Appreciate you being here tonight.
Well, I think that's it, Tim. You're the only one I can see right now. Um, everybody else is just uh, initials. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and stop my recording. Um, I'll send you all a link to the recording if you missed any or part of it later. And uh, I'll beg you for uh, – 